Well, we are gathered here again, united in Jesus the Christ. Shalom. In recent weeks, I have listened to various Bible-based sermons from very sincere Christian pastors. And there's a list, it's a short list, it's a synopsis of what is happening in the world today. Global idealism is rising on this planet. An international economy is being requested. A one world government is being called for by heads of states of various countries. Invasive surveillance technology is rapidly increasing. Spiritual and moral corruption is raging every place you look. Proliferating lies and deception are the norm. There's been a major increase of Christian persecution like nobody here in this room has ever seen before. There's an explosion of hostility towards Israel and the Jewish people. And the next Jerusalem temple, as we speak, is ready to be built at a moment's notice. The coalition of nations forming to invade Israel is in place as we speak. This morning we're going to look at the biblical meaning of hope using Old Testament scriptures and New Testament scriptures. The world where we currently live is on fire. And in this 21st century, our American Republic that God graciously gave us as an experiment is almost 250 years old. But it is now engulfed in flames. We know that. It's engulfed in flames in every way imaginable. We didn't even have these thoughts in earlier times. No one in the previous 20th century, and many of us here, are well aware of that century. None of us could ever have imagined that final biblical prophecy might become a reality so quickly. Now just before our church picnic on June 26, that was a month ago, as you remember, Ron Coots went through various scriptures. And he had a lot of scriptures from Isaiah 59. And Ron illustrated for us various aspects of the, challenging, of the challenges engulfing us right today, similar to the challenges that faced Israel in 700 BC. As Christians, we all of us attempt to analyze the first 4,000 years of man's existence. And we also have done that for the next 2,000 years called the church age. This is our history. It was after Christ first came, his first advent to this planet. As we have said in the past, the more things change, the more things stay the same. And one, as we have already heard this morning, one of the essential needs that remains the same in every single generation, man must always, always have what? Hope. Now a key question, therefore, for mankind in every generation, where does man's hope come from? Isaiah prophesied primarily to Judah, the southern part of the Israeli people, Israel in the north, 
Judah on the south. Isaiah saw the idolatry of the Jewish people. He prophesied the coming destruction of Judah, and he was right on. The Babylonians came. Looking at Psalm 96, verse 4, this clearly describes one of the root problems of the nation of Israel and, may I add, America. Here's what it says. For great is the Lord, amen, and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods, small g. For all of the gods, small g, of the peoples are idols. Idolatry masquerades as hope. Welcome to America. But there still is hope for America, isn't there? Maybe. I want you to listen to David's lament in Psalm 131, verse 3. And in so many ways, we've sung about that, and some of your prayers involved this this morning for your scriptures. O Israel, hope in the Lord. That's a command. From this time forth and forever. This is no small subject we're talking about today. This is our major life understanding. Thankfully today, there are still some messianic Jewish pastors. You, Jesus is their Lord. And there's still biblical Gentile pastors who are teaching the hope of Christ. As Bud emphasized, it's the hope is Christ. Perhaps you are familiar with a Kingston Trio hit song from the 1960s. Now I'm telegraphing my age here. And that song asks a question. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time passing. Long, long time ago. Well, the song answers this question. The answer is young girls have picked them. When will they ever learn? When will they ever learn? And where did the young girls go? Gone to husbands, every one. And the husbands went to being soldiers. And the soldiers went to graveyards, every one. And the graveyards went to flowers, every one. When will they ever learn? When will they ever learn? Scripture passages this morning that we look at give us warnings as well as it gives us hope. We are a 2022 generation. But here's the question. When will we ever learn? We're not gonna rush these verses, we're gonna ponder them. The scripture is still bedrock. You have your own commentaries, some are on the internet, and these are all good. And these help us, give us some understanding. A lot of us here read the daily bread. But these are for our help. The main is the scripture. Jeremiah, in chapter 29, verse 11, here's what he said. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. The what? The plans. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and to give you a hope. Now, Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. He suffered greatly. Why did he suffer? He was so distressed by the sins of the people. And he was so distressed by
by the leaders of these people. Does that sound familiar? Looking at Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Here we get some instruction on our personalities, our temperament. But they who wait, who what? Who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Wow. Isaiah clearly was looking ahead to when Israel as a nation would be awakened for why God had chosen them to be his special people. There's a coming day when Israel will be totally free to worship their returning Messiah, the Yeshua of their life. And now David in Psalm 39, verse seven, he says, O Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you, and we've heard that from every angle, and we need to hear it. David challenges us that in our sorrows, especially in our setbacks, anybody here having a sorrow or having a setback of any kind today? Maybe all of us in one form or another. But during these times, it is impossible to understand what we are to be actually waiting for unless we are hoping with complete abundance, and this is what so many people are missing today, for the return of Jesus Christ. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, we read this. Be strong and be courageous and do not fear or be in dread of them, meaning the people that are going to come against us no matter what age. God's law had to be given again. That's what Deuteronomy means, second time. There was a whole generation that had wandered in the wilderness that was not going to cross the Jordan, the promised land, anybody 20, over 20 years of age, because they had not obeyed God. We have an obligation to our young generation. They have to hear. They have to hear the law of God, and they're not hearing it. We've wiped it away from their slate in every activity. But that law has to be given again and again. In Proverbs 22, 23, verse 17, this is such an impact on every one of us. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but live in the fear of the Lord always. Surely there is a future. It's a done deal. And your hope will not be cut off. Wow. Have you ever envied somebody? even a non-believer, just maybe for a day? I confess I have. Solomon states that there are many influences that can tempt true believers into envying other people for a season. Very common in sports. Or even great musicians. The defense against this is to clearly keep one's future with Christ foremost in our mind. That has to overshadow any envy that we are pulled into. And that's going to happen if the fear of God's holiness is reverently and continually in our heart. That's easy to say, but boy, is that hard to practice and live it. 
Back to David in Psalm 71, verse 5. This is interesting. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord. And now listen to how he finishes this. From my youth. I pondered this verse for a while. Now the most obvious interpretation is for those who are young physically. But the Hebrew word here is juvenile. And just perhaps, maybe we can interpret that our hope and trust in our Savior comes only after our juvenile attitude towards Jesus is removed, born again. But whether you're 10 or 110 or anything in between, if you have not been born again, you're a juvenile in understanding what life with the Lord is all about. Solomon again in Proverbs 24, verse 14. Now he puts another dimension onto this whole thing of hope. Know that wisdom is such to your soul if you find it. Find what? Find wisdom. If you find wisdom, there will be a future. And your hope will not be cut off. So the plot thickens just a little here. First of all, where is wisdom found? I don't care how many schools you've attended or titles you've acclaimed. There's only one place wisdom is found. And that's in Jesus Christ. Let's comment on that a moment. Every human being has an accumulation of experience. It's called learning on the job. And some of this experience is good or some of it is very discouraging. Or it's a combination of both. But only God can sort out your experiences that are profitable to our soul. And that's what's called wisdom. He makes that cho choice. We don't. And sometimes if we don't have God, we think we have wisdom, which we don't. Also in Isaiah 41.10, here's a message again to the Jews. Fear not, for I am with you. Who's with them? God. Be not dismayed, but I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now here's the message to Israel. If God is truly with Israel, which he certainly is, you can't read the scriptures without coming to that conclusion they will be upheld by the very hand of God in spite of themselves. And what a mess they have made of being the called people. But note this, if God is going to carry through his promises to Israel, he's going to carry through his promise to the church. Oh, here's a spoiler alert. Read the book of revelation when will we ever learn now we're going to get into some new testament verses that they all point us to hope in one form or another and i'm going to touch on this same verse that you use today if that's all right with you bud paul wrote to the romans in 1513, chapter 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. After his resurrection, Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit. He's our comforter. 
He's our forever instructor. You and I cannot possibly read the scriptures without the power of the Holy Spirit opening up our goofy minds. Paul also wrote in Romans 12, verse 12, rejoice in hope. That's, you know, when you're going through troubles and I'm going through troubles, I can't rejoice in those troubles, but I can rejoice in the hope that is to come. And he says, Paul says to the Romans, be patient in tribulation. And here's another command. Be constant in prayer. And that's not just something to think, yeah, and I'll walk away. I mean, me, walk away and say, yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you, Lord, without carrying it through. To be constant in prayer, that's, that's, that, that's the challenge. I look at it this way. When we get, wake up in the morning, before we even look at that guy, that gal in the mirror, we are to be joyfully content that we do not have a sometimes hope, a fickle hope, a vague hope, but we have eternal hope. This is special, this hope. And that's what we're seeing today in every scripture we read. And certainly, every time we pick up the Bible. And we'll be to be ready with this hope before the onslaught hits. You're all familiar with cases of people that have suffered onslaughts, either physical, mental, relational. And this has to be our hope before any of these things occur. We can't just expect to be inert and all of a sudden then when it hits, we get hope. But when that onslaught hits, in any form, we have to keep the communication channel wide open with God. This is the hope we can all rejoice in. If we do not know this now, when will we ever learn it? Last week, Bud finished the study of Hebrews. And we've been in this for up to a couple of years. In chapter 11, the faith verse, verse 1, and you probably know it by heart, now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Boy, that is a great overview, isn't it? Now, everyone here has personally placed their fingers on the wounds of the risen Christ. And you can share that experience with all you meet on the highway of life, just like Thomas, right? Not really. But it is the Holy Spirit that clears out all of our cobwebs of doubt. He, the Holy Spirit, leads us through the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ when we pick up his word. And through that process, we are assured, as Hebrews says, we are convicted, and our hope is secured by faith. In Romans chapter 8, Paul again brings this point to us. 8, verse 24. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For the who hopes for what he sees. Boy, I did a lot of thinking on this one. <laughs> for what it's worth. I'd like to suggest that this is why so many of today's younger generation 
can be bewildered by the, need, the necessity of personally acquiring faith. The latest generations have become accustomed to punching keys and immediately seeing a picture or a video or a text that indicates their question and answers it, or at least it gives man's answer. I have nothing against technology. I wish they would have had computers in my heyday when I was in business, but it has a limit. None of these instant responses when you do this or look at this or that, None of these can answer one's deep desire to understand their humanity. Created by an eternal creator who continually is available to listen to their pleas. For a hope that is real will not fade. But you see, when we talk about faith, faith in him is the challenge. This is what young people aren't equipped to understand. None of us as young people were equipped to understand that. And here's what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ according to his great mercy Amazing grace, right? He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Now, did you get that? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let me repeat that. He has caused us, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Don't boast that you're a Christian, but boast in Jesus Christ. We could not have reached this point without the call of Christ on our heart, our life. It's in the book. In Romans chapter 15, verse 4, Paul says, For whatever was written in former days, what, 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 when is that? That's thousands of years ago. The Bible still is the most read book in the whole world. It outnumbers every other book. It's more accurate than any other historical book that has ever been written. It was written for our instruction, Paul says, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Saying it another way, without this, without the mind of Christ, it is impossible for us to have any hope. Oh, you can hope in other things, but you don't have hope. Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 13, now you're very familiar with this verse. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. God provides for us our faith. He shows us our hope lies in him. But the reason that these exist is so that we can go and love other people in spite of ourselves. That's the byproduct. Paul told the Colossians in 1 verse 27, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You are a walking mystery to so many people. And if people want to find out the mystery of life, which is Jesus the Christ, you're it because you have the mind of Christ. You are the hope of glory, of God's glory. He's looking to all of his children to glorify him throughout eternity. And there's no better understanding of hope than just that. Now here's one. 
Paul also says in Romans 5, 5, and hope does not put us to shame. Have you ever been ashamed of Christ? Have you ever been ashamed of the scriptures? Have you ever been ashamed to go amongst the crowd and go against them in love and gentleness? Or have you been ashamed that maybe your status would suffer? And he continues, hope does not put us in to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts. This is not just a little, I want you to hear something. He has poured his love into us through the Holy Spirit. And we didn't ask for the Holy Spirit. He gave it to us. We had no choice. Thank God. The Holy Spirit poured God's love into us. My cup runneth over. In Titus chapter 3, verse 7, so that being justified by his grace, amazing grace, amazing grace, we might become heirs according to what? The hope of eternal life. There are so many people that are so depressed today they have removed themselves from life. What a waste. But they had no hope. And they had no hope for eternity. Eye has not seen and ear has not heard what we're going to be. But through faith we have that hope. And this is two more verses. I'll end the comments, I'll, I will end the comments this morning with 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But in your hearts... Don't look around. In, our, in my heart, every one of us says this. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. What does that mean? Holy, holy, holy. Sanctified, purified, free from sin, righteous. Set apart. This is not to give you pride. This is to give you hope and joy and glory always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope for the for the mystery that is in you yet do it with gentleness and respect soon we're going to be in a summit circle here today and i would challenge all of us to today have ready what you would give to somebody if you were asked today on the way home on, at the gas station or one of your family members, why do you have the hope that's in you? What would you say? What would be your exact words? Not that you don't have other words <laughs> other time, but how would you answer somebody today? Why do you have the hope that is in you? I'm going to leave us with this. This is the accumulation of what this is all about. This is where not only the rubber hits the road, this is the analysis of, of our eternity. It doesn't get any better than this. In Revelation 21, 4, he, Jesus, will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Death shall be no more. There will be no more grieving, mourning, crying, pain anymore. Why? For the former things have passed away. Thank you, Father. There is only one answer to hope. It totally resides in you. How we love you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May you be glorified in all that is done. In Jesus' name, amen.